Hi, everybody. Um, welcome to today's panel, UX mishaps and how to prevent them. Today, we're joined by Open Source's top UX engineers and product leaders to dig into these UX mishaps and ultimately help us learn how to prevent them in the future. Why were they so bad? What were the ramifications? How did they shape the future? And how can we prevent it in the future? Um, to our attendees and participants, think about these questions I just posed and ask your own questions about UX mishaps in the chat. I'm Rachel Petrie, um, an interaction designer at Red Hat. I design for OpenShift and I'm a contributor to Patternfly and open source design system. Our chat facilitator today will be SJ Clark, who works as a senior user experience researcher at Red Hat, who will be watching over the chat and helping facilitate our questions. I'm joined here today by Catherine Robson, Hoover, Alex Porcelli, right, to share their experiences as leaders in the field. Kat, will you kick off our intros? My name is Catherine Robson. I'm a manager of user experience design at Red Hat. I've been in the UX industry for over 15 years doing design research um, and management of UX teams. And I currently manage a team of about uh, 30 people in uh, Red Hat who are um, working on the developer experiences that we provide from Red Hat. Um, I guess I'll go next. My name is Roxanne Hoover. I'm a principal interaction designer at Red Hat. Um, I oversee um, a few different projects, including Red Hat Satellite, Insights, and um, CCX. Um, I've worked in a number of different industries. I've worked on enterprise as well as um, consumer facing applications throughout my career. And I'm super vocal and opinionated, which is one of the reasons why I think that I am here. Great, thanks, Jax. Alex? Yeah, um, hi, I'm Alex Porcelli. I'm a senior principal software engineer at Red Hat. Uh, working as a principal architect for business automation tools. Um, I've been involved in, in tops related to user experience uh, uh, for the last nine years, um, engaged in working together with UXD team, Catherine Group. Um, I'm proud of what we accomplished together, but I think I've been invited here because all the countless horror stories that I accumulated over the years. That's great. Thanks, Alex. And Dana? Sure. Hi, my name is Dana Gutschreit. So I work as a manager with user experience and design team here at Red Hat. Um, and I still get to write code when they let me periodically. So that's been my, uh, my, my first love was front end development. Been doing that for about the last 20 years or so. And, and for now, my focus has been on uh, Patternfly, which is our open source design system. But we also have uh, code and components in it. And I also help support our front end developers uh, on various Red Hat products. Great. And I, I, we already have our first question. I'll ask this group, what has been the UX mishap you've seen out there that caused a large scale shift in how we think about user experiences? Yeah, so I actually talked about this one in my talk earlier. Um, Facebook is one that really comes to mind as kind of a spectacular <laughs> mishap out there as far as user experience. Um, you know, the the Facebook privacy uh, capabilities have been called into the public eye and that's um, been really a challenge, I think, for Facebook to figure out, you know, how to handle so much attention on uh, some experiences around, um, you know, user privacy and, and data control and how to offer those. Yeah, Facebook's a, an interesting one because there's like how you view it professionally and then how you view it personally. So sometimes those two things mix. Um, I always stayed away personally from creating a Facebook account because it made me really nervous putting that much information out there. As a developer, knowing how much damage I could do <laughs> when I write bad code and being nervous saying, okay, everyone's, just, we're just human. Um, but staying away watching this that reinforced my personal decision saying, okay, I think I, I dodged a bullet by staying away, but as a developer, it made me think even more about just how much responsibility we have when dealing with people's information and, and how easy it is to get into a situation where we make mistakes or things just get out of hand. We're trying to trying to, to put these features in place. 
I'm going to get a little more philosophical and um, say it's not just Facebook, but social media in general. And kind of how I see it is, you know, this, you know, users placed a trust in these applications to protect their data. And that's clearly not what happened. I don't know where that first assumption came from that original, like, yes, they're going to do everything right for me. So to me, it, it becomes from a user experience perspective, this sort of, you know, balancing act between like what, you know, user expectations were and what reality actually was. And I don't, I don't know where the source of all that, that source of truth, like from that angle came from, but that's how I kind of see that whole situation. Yeah, I kind of had a full arc of experiences um, with Facebook as a MySpace user and kind of followed um, other friends onto Facebook. And I always have a, probably a healthy skeptical eye towards um, social technologies. And I think it was a little, I um, worked for a while um, on the security team of an e-commerce company and, and learned a lot about, you know, things that the end user doesn't see for privacy. And seeing that, you know, shortly after play out um, for Facebook, it, you know, really reinforced why I had come in um, a little bit more skeptical. And then I shortly after, after just out of Facebook because I feel very similar to Rocks that the least they can do is for us with all of the information we give them is be respectful of our, our privacy. I mean, that's really the least we can do, they can do for their users. So um, yeah, that's definitely a big UX mishap in my book. Yeah, and I think it's, it's great to like, you know, have a uh, industry example that's so clear out there that everybody can maybe relate to. But, you know, since we're all red hatters here, uh, maybe it's good to turn the eye on ourselves and look at our own mishaps too. Um, Alex, I remember, you know, when I first came to Red Hat, the JBPM team was working on some social features. That a little bit. Ah, uh, yes. So that's one, <laughs> one, one of those mishaps that happened. So year 2012, uh, we have a new member coming to the team. We need to find a work that was out of critical path. So, so this new member would explore the technology, but deliver something that is not exactly part of our commitment. 2012, what we can do? The best idea that I have, let's add a social uh, platform integrator, like a, a social aspect to the platform. The context is we are an enterprise software for business application. I don't think they are much willing to get social interaction. They just want to have their work done. And the context of that is like, it's kind of a bunch of developers working, creating business process, business rules. The context for process would be um, more focused on another thing, but we created the social feature. It was exciting by a lot of things that we could imagine. And, uh, and uh, because this is a new um, engineer coming, he, he, he wanted to show the, the, some good work, right? And of course, we over-engineered the whole feature. It was super complex. So it was not just the display things, but how we treated the followers, the unfollowing, and the how just to build the events and how to do things. So that was an impressive uh, situation that we created for Ms. Hat because definitely that was not the, 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 the proper place to add social features. Um, it reminds me so much of like, you know, this desire to want to be innovative and to ad like adopt new technology without always considering if it's really appropriate for that moment. I, I can tell you even over the last, even the last week, um, you know, I've been working with my team on some designs and we're trying so, so hard to put in this, 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 it's not new, but it's like, it's new for the industry, right? It's new for web app or enterprise applications. And, you know, every time we run these beautiful designs by all, you know, by all intents and purposes by the customer, they're like, yeah, I just want a table every time. So you deflate a little bit, right? Because you're like, oh, okay. But I think what the example you gave, Alex, reminds me so much of that. Like we're trying, we're, we, we want to be innovative. We want to be creative. 
and sometimes it, it's to our own detriment. Yeah, and, and and there is also consequence to the feature, right? Because it goes beyond just the some screens in the UI. Um, it goes towards the infrastructure that I had to put in place. We have just one thread just to listen to events, and another thread that we create a new uh, another events, and we have a, a third thread that had to serialize that. So we don't want to lose the events, right? It's a it's a social place. We don't want to miss anything that the other engineers were that I'm following, they're doing, open a file, close a file. Everything was generating actions in the system. So we create a lot of uh, backend infrastructure that was not helping, that's it, that's by this way. The social aspect, that was pretty common across a lot of enterprise, right? I remember where I worked um, even before Red Hat, that was such a big thing. They're looking at a lot of social media starting up saying, how can we embed this in our application? And it was around a similar time that other thing that something similar was happening, not with social aspects, but looking at other technology and saying, can we adopt it really quickly? So one thing that happened to us was, and it cost years of time, was was the advent of Flash in enterprise software. So there was this thing that came along called Flex back in the late 2000s, 2006, 2007, Macromedia. And then Adobe introduced it and a lot of enterprise software is like, this is going to be great for making dashboards because it'll, it will look the same everywhere we put it. And you didn't have to worry about browsers and all these other problems. We said, we'll just use Flash as a way of, of delivering that. Um, and we jumped on that bandwagon, spent a long time building out some flex dashboards because they could be compiled and they felt very enterprise-ish. Um, but then, and I started looking at the history, like, so what, what happened? What blew up with that? And then it was shocking because it was Steve Jobs wrote this open letter about thoughts on Flash. And it just completely blew the whole thing up. Like the CEO of Adobe responds and everyone starts taking sides in the Android and Apple. And everyone's like, we don't want to run this on our mobile device platform. But it effectively killed it. And I think in 20, right this, this year sometime, a lot of browsers are going to finally stop. It, it's just going to be completely disabled with absolutely no hope of getting it running. So it had sort of a slow death, but in terms of a, an experience problem where all of this stuff that we built just had to disappear, it was a, it was a pretty big one for us. I have a good experience around also Flash. Um, we, I, I had to be involved in, on a proprietary system that was all based in Flash that we had to convert to standards, HTML, CSS, JavaScript that, back in the days. But, uh, and one thing that I want to, in the context of Red Hat that I were talking here, is like, I, I mentioned the mishap that happened on JBPM that was that was a mishap, but that's the advantage of open source perspective because this all was done on the community. And uh, in, in baking time in community before becoming part of a product and roll out to these two main enterprise um, uh, customers out there. So we had the baking time to get the feedback and say, um, and work close with Catherine and, and work with the team that reassess, reevaluate. Is this the best option? Is it uh, that that was, uh, I think, a, a very appealing for us, at least my perspective, that open source helps a lot how the, our model is. More. And I think that that bridges really well into those questions that just came out. And thinking about open source in these terms of, do you think these organizations and projects were able to come back from these UX mishaps? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, I think Alex just gave a great example of how you can kind of save yourself before you cross the line of no return. <laughs> um, I think in, you know, in Facebook's um, situation, they, they certainly might have crossed that line of no return with a good uh, part of their market. Uh, there's, of course, people that will stick with Facebook forever those that won't but they really tarnished their brand um with that quite a bit and i think it's pretty hard when you actually you know impact the your brand reputation and what people perceive as what your value is and what um you're willing to do for them uh that can be really really difficult to recover from and just to add on what kat was saying um 
you know, that aside from social media in general, in my mind being tarnished right now, everyone's, you're always a skeptic. What are you signing up for? What are you giving away? But they had, you know, the eye of the government turned on them, right? It's not just with the users. I mean, the, the federal government is looking at them, looking at the industry in general and saying what's going on here. So um, recovery, I mean, they're so big probably, but like, what does that, what does that mean? I mean, look, sound looks like a big headache to me, but yeah, I such an interesting, yeah, such an interesting problem because I think Facebook damaged their own reputation, but did they da damage the idea of social media as a whole? Like, kids still love sharing things about themselves, and and it's just basically it's just the next thing. So now it's well, it, you you could say one now, and it would be gone in a, a week or two if somebody watches a recording here. So it moves so fast. So I think it's just made a lot of people very skeptical, like you're saying about privacy. And then just people make a decision, like, do I put everything out there? Just know that it's going to be open and I have no choice and it'll just be there forever. And I think a lot of people are becoming, especially younger people, either very comfortable with that or very resistant. It's just kind of divide, created this bigger divide in, in how people feel about security. Yeah. And uh, talking about the case that I was more involved in, right? I, I, I think we, we managed to come back somehow. If we can show some slides, I think we progress a lot to just have this process to bake in community, get interactions, get the working close definitely with UXD team that was like, in the beginning was just a bunch of engineers playing around the platform that were just a web tools and now it's becoming more structured things are having process so we evolved quite a lot from there at least i like to to think about that that way well, and that's <laughs> one of the one of the amazing aspects of of open source right is it can pair it can pair different roles together so in a world where engineers maybe only would have ever interacted with engineers you now do have the ability to interact with people of different roles there, there could be a content person there there could be a uxd person there all for the love of that project or for the you know dedication of that project you have that resource available that you you might not have had before yeah, I'm thinking about that flash example as well. And I'm thinking back to um, when I would go to these pages on these brands that I really cared about, and it would just be like a flash splash page that would stop me from like purchasing or buying or anything like that. And I'm thinking, were these brands able to recover from that like slow stop? you know, full experience, and then maybe you don't make it to the pathway that you um, had originally intended to go down. Um, so what do you think, Dana? Do you think they were able to recover? <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, a lot of code changes and churns so quickly that you just wait a little while. And, and then as long as you're still building things and you haven't lost all your customers, it's usually okay. Um, for this project, we pretty much deleted any code that was built for Flash and just started fresh. So it was, probably two to three years worth of a, a developer or two's time that was lost. Um, I think the bigger thing I learned from that is that being aware of what direction the industry is shifting in and not fighting it is a really key skill to learn as a developer. And especially in the, the user experience space, because you're right on the cutting edge and things will shift so fast with people's phones and devices introducing technology that if you can't respond to it, you're like, no, I love this technology. I'm going to stick with it until, I, until my dying day. You're, that's, you're just going to be stuck with it. And people are probably going to abandon what you've built. So that's something that I tried to take away from it is that you have to be aware of where the industry is going. And, and as soon as you start to see those things coming up in this groundswell where everyone's going in a direction, you're, you're better off not fighting it. Even if, even if they're wrong and you say, hey, that's not the right technology and you know it in your heart. It's, it's not going to matter because things will shift so fast. Yeah, I think one of the things that I've learned in this industry, uh, you know, watching all of these technology changes, like Tina has been saying, is that you just like, especially from a designer perspective, you have to not get caught up in all of those technology changes. Your engineering teams are like super excited about it. And you have to like create a little bit of a wall there and be like, that's great. <laughs> but I need to focus on the user and design what they need. And you can play around with whatever technology helps you achieve that, but let's just focus on the right design. Um, and 
And so often in this industry, you know, we all get caught up in those kind of ground wave uh, movements around, you know, social media, around new technologies, around everything else. And it's, you have to take that step back and keep a level head sometimes. But um, I know for from a design perspective, I mean, what's the saying? Throwing the baby out with the bathwater. You have to get used to it. I joke with I joke with customers and people that I meet with, like, don't worry, but you can tear the design apart. It's fine. I'm not emotionally invested. I've 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 matured in my career where it's like, okay, okay, feedback is good. What what do we got to change here? You know, not to get not to think that the way that I did it was absolutely the right way. A friend of mine who is a designer, his tagline is strong op opinions loosely held. Yeah, that's right. And I I feel like that um that like sentiment of of like loosely holding our our strong opinions like really functions well in the open source community, um, where we're hearing a lot of different and um, we have a lot of valid um, thoughts being um, put into um, the pool of things to be considered, like design, engineering, beyond, like, you know, it, it all comes to the table. And that's what we love about open source. And that's why we're here. And I think that this next question really speaks to that, which is in what ways can or prevent this? Yeah, I think we touched on that a little bit. I mean, the fact that we get this technology out in front of users in sort of like a very beta way uh, before we're releasing it in, a, in our enterprise kind of GA ready mode is um, really advantageous. And beyond that, because we're actually building it in that upstream, we're building it in a transparent and open way where others can participate. It means that you get a very large diversity of opinions. Um, you can really, uh, gut check some of those decisions along the way so that maybe, you know, if you're about to make a mishap, you have a whole community of people jump in and have an opinion about that situation. And sometimes that can be super rough. Like you, when you're not ready for that uh, level of <laughs> feedback and opinion, um, that, that can feel really tough. But at the end of the day, it's part of what makes open source so great is because we can have that diversity of opinion, um, have those conversations in the upstream, in the community, and then uh, come out the door with a much better and stronger and more like ethically sound and everything else uh, project. Yeah, and adding to that, it's like it, it, that you said, uh, Kat, there is the passion. People involved in the community, they are passionate. Usually they, they care a lot. And uh, the feedback is candid in that way that, that came with passion. Sometimes a little bit too much passion that 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 what happens, but it just it opens so much. In the world that we're being talking recent, not it has been really in the in the media today, that's the diversity that we're talking here in the open source. In a community that's across the globe, you have people around the world having their input. And that's a very unique position that you have uh, uh, eyes of the world consuming and contributing and passionate about the technology that you are building. And that, uh, I don't think it prevents the mishaps, but it gives you during this baking time that you just mentioned that you, you put something very alpha beta stage you can adjust quickly. You have a, a, a way to, to understand the feedback that's not in the traditional closed source uh, environments or proprietary technology that it's running. And I bet all of us have an experience with a software or anything that, oh, I just wanted to submit a, a pull request there that it fixed this annoying issue that I face every day using whatever software we do. I just need to echo again what, what Alex is saying. I mean, I know that the upstreams that I'm involved in, a lot of them are global. And I, I cannot tell you the value that comes out of a, a global set of eyes. It's it's no longer even from a cultural standpoint, there's super there's there's a tremendous amount of value in the perspective they see on the work that I do when I've submitted even 
visual design work up to the upstream community. I, that's been, that's been, frankly, I, I mean, it would make my job so much harder not to have them there. Yeah, I like having a community for the code to work on. I think another aspect for, for some of these mishaps is if, is if the code had been open, it would have been so much harder to hide from people what was happening with their personal information because people would have just dug in said okay this is the stream of where my data is going who, you know what's being done with it and they would have been able to see what how it's being stored and 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 all those pieces so it makes it a lot harder for for companies or anyone who's maybe not behaving in in an upstanding way to hide what they're doing or when they are and they say hey really you can trust us they can just say hey go look at the code if you have a question and it's right there and that that makes a huge difference yeah, now I've gotten used to that level of accountability. And um, when I'm like contributing to an open source design system, I really depend on that feedback. And, you know, maybe in other environments, I would have to, um, you know, pull that out of, um, of others. And I just, I just love that folks bring it to the table and from different backgrounds as well. Um, and, and early on, you know, it's, it's better to learn about something early than than later after the fact. So yeah, I I just think that's really well said. And um, I know that a really fun question came in that I think is a good thing to, um, for us to wrap up on today, which is what's one UX mishap that you've had with this new work remote environment? And how did you get through it? I think we've all had one of these come up, uh, maybe a few, maybe 10, maybe more uh, through this time. So I would love to hear about your experiences and uh, share that with the group. Virtual school. So good. If virtual school was open source, I wouldn't have probably 75% of the problems I have going on with the login and log out of Chromebooks of you know, single sign-ons from other systems overriding Chromebooks, Chromebooks overriding single sign-ons. Oh my goodness. That, that, we need another session for this. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it happened. You just mentioned it just happens now. I'm facing a problem that I the school IT cannot solve yet. During the summer, my son got access to his account, the school account, and he changed the password. Fine enough. They, the Chromebooks are were delivered. So he logged in, in the, because it used the Google account, right? But the school set up a lot of other applications with the, that default password, but connected to the Google account. What happens now is he cannot access any application. So just the Google Classroom. But the other application videos, he's blocking everything. And uh, because the password is just short, the original password is just short, they managed to, uh, they probably have a communication with Google directly an API level. And I cannot send it back to be able to work. So at this point, nobody can change his password to original one. And the, the other applications too have the, the, the original that is incompatible. It was almost the opposite. I had to buy a Chromebook for my daughter. So it ties to a Gmail account. So when she would go to log into Google Classroom because it's a Chromebook, it's trying to use her personal Gmail. It's overriding the school's authentication needed to actually access Google Classroom. I mean, I have to say we're pretty lucky because we actually understand how these workflows work. Otherwise, I mean, it could it would have taken a parent weeks to figure this out. I figured it out in a few hours, but still, I mean, oh my goodness, it was very frustrating. The whole environment's fascinating. <laughs> it's, it's just so amazing to watch what's happening and and. I have to give these teachers so much credit for trying to figure these things out on spur of the moment. It's it's amazing what they're what they're doing in this state right now. But I my daughter asks me, how come every time I walk by the table, I shake my head or I sigh? And it's and it's like Scarlett, that's my daughter. It's like all of your classes, either the teacher can't hear any of the students, she, her microphone's not working. The screen's not showing. The slides that she shared with the students aren't working, or when they click on a video, nothing happens. So, and then she says, "Well, you all have to make copies of the slides." And then you hear like Kevin from down the street, like saying, "Well, this is how you do it. You click the file menu." And, and these eleven-year-olds are all helping each other, and the teacher. Half like today, at least two of her classes were just canceled after fifteen minutes, not because the students couldn't connect. 
but because the teacher trying to use it wasn't able to get the equipment connected so that she could teach the students. And I just, I, I, mean, I feel so bad for them. It's a huge usability problem because it's likely that their headset and whatever equipment they have connected, just something disconnected or chop, you know, a different output all of a sudden became selected. And then the teacher was just not able to get it back working again. And it's, you think about just something as simple as just, I want my headphones to keep working for six hours straight, which should be a relatively simple thing is almost, is almost impossible to get working consistently for them. Yeah, we actually, um, <laughs> just had a situation where we had somebody interview with Red Hat where their headphones swapped from the computer to their phone midway through the interview. And so we couldn't hear them and they were presenting. So they couldn't see the screen where everybody was trying to get their attention to say like, hello, we can't, we can't talk to you anymore. Like you're, you're presenting, but there's nothing we can do over here. And so you know, these technology kind of mishaps that happen with um, presenting in classrooms and video conferences, it's a real challenge when that's our like one way to communicate with each other right now. Man, that, go ahead, Rox, yeah. Could you imagine an open source community of like kindergarten parents, they would have it worked out with a 30, the, every parent in the world would be logged in, hammering away at the system. No, they'd all be on IRC, Roxanne. They would just abandon it and say, we're just going to go just text messaging. <laughs> what I think about is how adept all of these students are going to be at these tools. I mean, here I am, look like Kat was saying, looking for my screen share, you know, waving at people uh, like, you know, tell, tell me if I'm not sharing and then accidentally close, closing out of the Google Meet. So I think we still have some usability. Uh, things to work out for these for these young students and you know they'll be pros at it by the time by the time they yeah I, I have to give pop in a little bit of credit because at least they put the leave button like way in a different location than the rest of the buttons <laughs> somehow that is not a standard practice and everybody in the does middle. it <laughs> why yeah front and center every time yeah, I love how it's typed out, leave. <laughs> In it's red, very yeah. far of where you are clicking. That's amazing. Yeah, so um, I'm going to say thank you so much to all of our panelists um, and to all of you for, you know, all of our participants and question askers for attending today. Um, we um, have walked away learning that to, we should start early and often engaging um, with our open source communities um, when designing anything. Um, so we can work together to create solutions that meet our users' needs. Um, and it's clear that bringing open source into the design and development process enables hero moments in product where we really serve our users best. Um, those are all of the questions we have time for today. Thanks again for attending. Um, I'm so excited to send you all off into the weekend. And Alex, I think your new calling in life is to set up work from home stages for everybody, including <laughs> LEDs and LED bands and cloud lights. I would, I'll be your first client. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Thanks everybody for attending. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks everybody.